I guess you can hear me well. I hope so. Um, uh, thank you, Neil. Hi, everyone. My, uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Susie Ogihara from Panasonic Hollywood Lab, known as the PHL. I have to warn you, I just recently had COVID and then I lost my voice. So my voice is actually, this is as much as I can do. Um, uh, and then I hope this is uh, good enough for you guys. I'm really humbled to be part of this uh, particular conference because I hope that I can bring you a different perspective of what you guys are trying to do. Again, my name is Susie Ogihara from Panasonic. And then what we do over here is we serve as R&D, Research and Development Outlet for the Greater Panasonic Corporations. Now, when it comes to Panasonic, um, uh, I know each one of you have a slight different definition depending on your age, regions, and what you have been exposed to. Panasonic is known for TV, house goods, and others, but Panasonic can be found where you might not even notice. Well, the company itself is more than 100 year old, and then the very first invention by the founder is actually a double light socket, which looks like this. A little history for everyone, early 1900 in Japan, because the Wei Power Company only had one type of contract, which every household will only have one light bulb on the ceiling as the source. There was no wall socket concept at all. So at night, the only socket will be used for the lighting and anyone who wanted to use for ironing or heating would not have the ways to do so. So this device actually solved the problem for them and then made it convenient for the regular people to enjoy and then to make the life more convenient and comfortable. And then the picture on the left is what it looked like. Again, this is 100 years ago. So I found, and then I, I am just finding out this 100 year old invention is still available on Amazon, Home Depot, and Walmart. So um, I believe the core DNA in Panasonic is to solve problem by creating tools to help solve that problem. So um, uh, that is why we have grown into so many different marketplaces, And most of the time that I do is I interview a lot of people to also finding out what is their problem and um, um, what kind of tools are needed in order to solve those problems. So great, you get it. But why am I relevant to this conference? And how did I meet Neo? Well, as part of the problem solving, in the early 1990s, Panasonic, for a split second, we owned Universal Studio. The reason behind it was back in the days, the main out of home entertainment was going to the movies. However, as content can only be enjoyed at the movie theater, a physical location, studios and other content creators wanted to have other ways to carry the same experience they get essentially how the contents can be enjoyed beyond the theater environment, meaning they wanted you to enjoy it at home. So comes with the home entertainment revolution, meaning technology needed to advance there. So Panasonic has been solving many problems in many different industry, entertainment, housing, you name it, we have some footprint in it. And then, um, um, so during the home entertainment um, uh, revolution era, we were talking about the next technology for the TV to enjoy at home. And then as Neil mentioned in the beginning, he was involved with the stereoscopic and which is the 3D technologies. And one of the conference for the first time, the PC gamer industry were invited. Up until then, only Sony and Microsoft were invited into those kind of a conference. And I believe, Neil, I think it was at the Universal Hilton in LA. That, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. That was the first time I believe the PC gamers in any capacity was invited into those talking about the future of the technology. So, uh, during that time, the gaming industry was less understood and the many content companies were not really sure how to handle this sector. 
I knew back then, Neo and the PC gaming com community was onto something. So I have been collaborating, you know, whatever I can with Neo ever since. And I'm happy to see how it has evolved to today. So on this particular conference, when Neo reached out to me, and then I was like, hmm, I can share a different perspective. Probably this group hasn't even thought about, which is from the real estate point of view. And um, um, I hope my information will help you to give you a different type of uh, viewpoint. So uh, here we go. So when you talk about the future of the workspace or office or return to workplace is what we refer to now. Um, um, there is uh, four major layers of the group that we can categorize. But you know, when we talk about the return to the office or back to the office, I know many of you see some sort of media at least once a week to talk about, oh, the future of the office should be looking like this or this, you know, uh, there's some more article in here. But in reality, who are the stakeholders? So when we talk about the real estate um, or the office space, there is not all the same, but I'm just going to simplify for the purpose of this conference to categorize this as office as in the commercial building and not industrial or home office. So in this area, we have owner of the building and we have the leasing company between you know, those two, sometimes that we refer them as a landlord or the operating companies. And then we have the company who actually lease the space um, uh, referred as the tenant. And lastly, we have the employee who works for the company. So there are so many, you know, again, coverage to talk about, you know, you should come back as X number of the day. And then I think even yesterday they were talking about four days of the week um, uh, at the office is more desirable than anything else. So what is actually happening? Now, let's discuss this um, uh, from the viewpoint of the view building owner owner of the building and a leasing company who sometimes handle the operation of the building, their perspective on this side is as follow. And then the data might be shocking to you guys, but, um, uh, and then this data is actually from January um, uh, earlier this year, um, US and the UK shares about the same number. So 85% of the real estate owner believe there is strong future to office space. Only 14% does not, meaning 85% of the building owners are seeing demand for office space is strong in the long run. Remember, real estate investment is a long term. They are only looking at the long term, not the short term. So they are still seeing the demand is healthy. Therefore, they do not see any immediate need to change their space that they hold as an office into residential or any other space. So <clears throat> now what is the leasing side of the layer hearing from the leasing and the tenant layer then? The mass return to the office, is it fact or fiction? Uh, the world moves on from the COVID-19. Working life has returned to many of the pre-pandemic norms. Uh, work from the home Actually, work on the home pattern sticking or has the mass return to the office? That really depending on the location. Let's look at the key locations when we refer to is the US, UK, and Asia Pacific. So in the USA, the office isn't dead, but the sector, the sector itself is really challenged because of the COVID-19. And then they needed to cater to the flexible working and at least commitment and so on. But when it comes to the UK, high demand for office space, quality office highly thought, sought after next to no office availability in some parts of London. Believe it or not, Neo Toronto is almost the same. And uh, in the Asia Pacific, uh, rental growth expected in Hong Kong and then in Singapore. However, the work pattern hasn't changed that much and it hasn't reflected the office demand that much prior to pre-pandemic. But 
In the Asia Pacific alone, one of the key points that we're seeing is many tenants, and then, and then I believe this is coming from the employee also, there is a strong demand for the building to be healthy. They wanted to know what the building is offering as the in the ESG and the well and the health side of the business. So what does the workplace of the future really look like? How is the workplace changing? Has COVID-19 left its mark on the sector? This is what the workplace of the future will look like as office space undergoes a major rethink. Number one, which is flexible workspace. Sorry, this is just to show that the demand of the office space in the future is still very high. Um, uh, so um, the desire of the tenant is flexible workspace. And um, um, they are looking to have more flexible, you know, uh, arrangement with the landlord. And then also what has been happening is that they're looking into managed office, service office, and shared offices, also co-working spaces. So for example, um, co-working and shared offices was only 6% in London um, back in 2020. But this area is expected to grow to 30% in 2030. So while working patterns are cha changing, this is not necessarily leading to fundamental change. Um, uh, so this area is really still yet to be seen. Um, what they're looking for is high quality workspace and flexible, again, you know, um, also the flexible workspace as well. So um, uh, let's see. Now, as part of the lease space, uh, employee relations, and then expecting the key adoption of the workspace needs to include focus on the human. And uh, let's see. The key point is people and the five senses. Hybrid work does not fill the void of sense of human, human connections. For instance, you can't touch, smell, or share a meal as basic human being. Office space design went from open desk to, to private office and onto cubicle spaces and collaborative open spaces. In order to cater to post-pandemic needs, massive office overhaul is really needed. And this sector, meaning the real estate sector, understands that. As the workforce is Entering the age of human, multidimensional era, space needs to be designed, operated, and provided, not work from home, but work from anywhere, which is this particular group is focused on. Risk and reward, real estate industry needs to adopt and then change accordingly. That's the per what, what is the purpose of the office? And add well-being and an experience agenda massive shift from fixed to fluid. This is really is the core. Current office is just not flexible enough. Now, on the employee side, from the viewpoint of the real estate on a landlord, do they really know the customer or how do you define the customer? Who is the tenant or the employee who works at the tenant space, who actually drive the demand? because many of the offers that they are already stuck with their lease. And uh, like what John mentioned that there is a pros and con about having an office, but it is also very necessary. It's, it's really touchy subject on this one. So on these type of topics, one of the key discussion has been reimagining digital workplace productivity. Elevating the human experience through digital workplace improvement. Employers, I mean, employees have invested, sorry, employers have invested in more digital ways of working, but there is little evidence these technology solutions are moving the needles on workforce productivity. By redesigning the virtual and hybrid workplace with human at center, organization can improve 
the worker experience and then deliver real business result. Uh, historic, a historic shift in the future of work. So in today's world, digital tools are used to connect the complete workforce. For much of the knowledge for workforce, their digital experience is their workforce experience. But in a hyper-connected world where workers may affect market performance as much as customers do, many organizations have not yet addressed how their workforce can carry out their work optimally and how that affect their outlook in the digital environment provided for them. It turns out there is more to the digital workplace productivity than simply providing workers with online access to office applications. Although most organizations were able to quickly pivot to remote work, was not a small task we know, but for many it was business as usual overlaid with piecemeal digital solutions. To go from looking digital to living digital, the workplace must be redesigned to operate in synchrony and connect all workers to those that they work with when, where, and how they need it, regardless of location, device, or time zone. Making this shift requires connecting worker experience to business outcomes. By putting worker at the center of design of the design, it becomes possible to create a digital workplace that transform how people collaborate, get work done, and ultimately do business. From looking digital to living digital, a robust digital workplace enables business outcomes and amplifies workforce experience by augmenting one's ability to do work increase ability to collaborate across physical and digital places, providing insight and linkage to the organization's mission, connecting teams, support growth and development, and enhancing well-being and sense of belonging, equal meaning being human. Now, some industry can successfully embrace a hybrid or digital workplace they've been doing that forever. However, many of the industry should not and cannot reasonably do so. I will share this information that I am very familiar with. A financial institution that has more than 5,000 employees in a massive campus in the United States. The campus is brand new, class A building with all the amenities you can ask. Gourmet eatery, flexible schedule, top level gym, Childcare, you name it. They even have, I think it was um, um, uh, dip and dots on Wednesday and pizzas for Friday. Um, but however, when once the uh, COVID restriction was eased, the company asked them to the employee to commit three days, whichever days, you know, through Monday through Friday. It doesn't have to be consecutive or anything. Just commit those three days and then come back to work because they have to they have to align all the services around it. But only 30% of employees actually showed up to their own commitment, which means that they had 70% fail rate for the employees to commit to their own commitment. So they actually announced they, they actually did a different type of test this time. They announced their top executive when they will be in the office. And then they made it public. And uh, during those days, 90% of the people, 90% of the employees showed up on the days that they said that they would show up. So what it means is that maybe it's not any technology or amenity. Maybe employees are looking to for that human connection or connection itself. And um, based on their own data, we know their productivity 
which John also uh, might, I think that you guys all talked about the productivity as a remote org is actually higher. However, their data also shows that the, they cannot increase brand loyalty or a sense of connection to the company that they work for. So their data also show that even though they wanted the employee to stay longer, they are not seeing any commitment if they do not show their faces at the office. So one last thing is that I believe this group is very familiar with Bob Iger, which is with the Disney. He just came back to Disney, yay. And at his first um, town hall meeting, he announced that he will be in the office and that his top level executive will be in the physical office in Glendale as well. So we will see how that will contribute to the larger market itself, but we know creative industry does way better in actual human connection environment. Not all industry is the same, but we believe the um, 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 uh, some industry should have some sort of connection. So what the pandemic and the po post-pandemic has shown us is no one size fit all. Flexibility and how to adopt the changes fast is more important than ever. Currently, more entertainment companies are going back to office three to four days a week. How remote or work from anywhere where really means is yet to be seen. We just need to continue to identify the problem and then try to develop tools that can help solve the problem. Here's a graph of showing, um, this is as of end of October. These were the company um, saying, on the left side is you come back to the office. In the middle is that, you know, you can do a hybrid. And then on the right side is, okay, you can be remote or working anywhere. So, I hope this information um, uh, is helpful. And um, uh, thanks again for having me. I hope this is giving you a different perspective of when you talk about working at one everywhere. So back to you, Neil. <laughs> Fantastic, Susie. Just a, just a question, um, maybe it's an interpretation. So what, what I heard is that in the, the office environment, you didn't name the company, right? I want to make sure we didn't name a, a company. It was just I didn't name company. the company. Okay, because good, there, good. There is at least three company going through exactly the same data. Okay, so what I got out of it is, even though employees made a commitment to, I'll be at the office three days a week, they weren't fulfilling it. Like, but but they didn't want it, like they. But the what happened was when it was announced that the most senior executive was was going to be at the office in person you had a 90 percent return rate did i hear correctly correct so the you know my inter now you the way you described it what i heard was well people want that connection that's how i heard it <laughs> if it, like that human connection uh, did i did i hear it the way you described it properly so yes you, so you, if I can elaborate a little bit, because I think this is very interesting, because when I found out, I was like, you must be kidding, right? But they told me that, for example, this particular group of um, uh, department, um, um, let's say there is 100 people, they all committed to come on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So those three days that they should have a 100% employee there. But they were only seeing 30 people during those days. That, and that's on a high day, some of the day. Because remember, they, they are the campuses that they have to have food services, you know, cleaning people, you know, parking attendants, and so on, right? Uh, but on the same group of people that they say, your top senior executive will be there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Instead of having 30 people average, now they have 90 people. And then even though they know their productivity is going to be higher working from home on, you know, but they are like, okay, my boss is going to be there. So I'm going to be there. Hmm. See, there you go. That's the link. <laughs> we want the, we want the boss to see us. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's where the connection is. So um, uh, I think 
you know, I know I'm going over a little bit your overtime, but I hope this particular point is going to help when you develop the tools that having that human emotion in the center, it's not always, you know, just because I can work anywhere is, is going to be the key. It's really that human connection is the one that we, at least we're seeing, so. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, Susie. Stick around, it's been more to come.